made from stardust so shine. Peace and blessings, family, and welcome to Labors of Love podcast. We are here to inspire, uplift, and enlighten. Each episode, we will be hearing from Black midwives, doulas, and other traditional childbirth supporters who have dedicated their lives to being of service to Black mothers and families in all aspects of the motherhood journey. This evening, I have the pleasure of speaking with Stephanie Baker, PhD, MSPT. She is an assistant professor in public health studies at Elon University. Her research and activism interests are in racial health inequities, and the majority of her research uses a community-based participatory research approach. Her current research is in partnership with the Greensboro Health Disparities Collaborative, Can you hear me? Now I can, yes. <laughs> Excellent. Well, welcome. I am so grateful that you could join me this evening on Labors of Love podcast. Thank you for accepting the invitation. Sure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. And I never feel like, you know, we. I look online to kind of pull pieces together, but I never feel like the intros, you know, really do justice to just all of the phenomenal work that you're doing. So if you could just take a moment and kind of let us know who is Dr. Baker. Sure. Well, I always like to start out by saying that I am from um, a mother who grew up in the rural South and a father who grew up in the city in Chicago. So I'm kind of that mix of country sweet and also with a, you know, street sense as well. Um, and I think that really plays into my personality. But I like to define myself as a health equity researcher. I use an anti-racism and anti uh, and racial equity lens to better understand health inequities from a systemic and institutional perspective. So part of that involves helping to create space for narrative shifting and changing, um, highlighting the voice of folks who aren't always invited to the table and creating space for people to be heard and listened to and to create you know a new more accurate reality around you know what it is to be most impacted by the issues around public health and equities wow so how did you come into um this path what was it that kind of landed you here the process yeah, that's a great question. So my um, before I was in public health, I was actually working as a physical therapist in hospital settings and in outpatient settings. Mm -hmm. And I was actually observing health inequities in my patients and their outcomes and their diagnoses and was very um, frustrated because I I did not learn anything about that in, in, in uh, physical therapy school. So I really didn't know what to do with it and what was happening in most of the environments I was working in is people were just kind of blaming patients for the circumstances that they found themselves in. And I knew that that wasn't the issue because you can't create these types of patterns, you know, just because, you know, people are collectively, you know, not interested in their health. I, you know, I knew that wasn't true. And so as I sought to understand a little bit more of the root causes, um, folks said, you should think about public health, which I had never really heard about <laughs> before and um, ended up starting to learn more about public health and ended up back in public health school and then when I finished, was finishing my dissertation, one of my mentors invited me to a two-day training about race and racism. And, you know, to be honest, it was an Asian woman who invited me to the training. And I and I was kind of looking at her like, why do I need to spend two days, you know, learning about race and racism? Like I'm a black woman, like I get it. Um, but you know, sometimes you just listen to your mentors when they uh, make suggestions for what you should do. So I went. And, um, and what I realized is while I certainly had the experience and I had a lot of information that I didn't have a really strong analysis um, that was gonna actually do something to improve the very inequities that I was you know, hoping to have an impact on. And so through that training, I kept going back and meeting other people who live in Durham, which is where I am now. And we started organizing trainings in our own community 
And then as I strengthened my analysis, I found ways to integrate it into my research and into my teaching, into my parenting, um, into how I show up uh, in community spaces. And I was really grateful to be a part of the Greensboro Health Disparities Collaborative, which is a community medical academic partnership that really um, has demonstrated and you know uh, trained me in what it means to be to do authentic community partnership and to keep a focus on structural and institutional racism. So, so I so I think that brings into um, what is meant by using more of a community um, based. A research model. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of explain for, for the lay people, um, <laughs> what does that mean? Sure. So well, I call it um, community-based participatory research. And I just want to acknowledge that there's lots of other ways to name it. Some people call it community action research or community participatory action research. Um, and there's lots of different ways that people actually act it out. But from my understanding and in the way that I've been trained up in it, it's really about partnering together communities, academics, um, to uh, partner together at every stage of the research proce mm -hmm. process, from identifying what the problem is, you know, to applying for funding to solve it, to creating the program, to evaluating the program, to writing it up, to disseminating it in as many way, you know, ways and shapes and forms that you can, but really authentically partnering with each other along the way, to having conversations about power dynamics and um, you know, creating economic opportunities for people that typically we ask to do a lot of volunteer work with, um, and seeing that we're all bringing different types of expertise into our understanding of the problem. And it's actually through kind of this collaborative effort where we take our titles, you know, off and, and we really think deeply about what it means to solve the issues that our, our communities are experiencing. Mm -hmm. And that's very different from traditional research, which kind of just asks people to participate as subjects, right? And not have a part in defining what the research actually looks like and what it does. Um, or research where, you know, an academic might get a grant, you know, and be looking for a community to partner with um, and so they've already figured out, you know, what they're going to do and they just kind of need a partner to be a part of the whatever the grant requirements are. Yeah. So they bring people kind of along for the ride without really creating power sharing where they can say, well, that's not really what we need to deal with. You know, that that's mm -hmm. not going to solve the issues that we're talking about. Wow. So I think that's an amazing segue into some of the the research that you've been doing. And I know, you know, you have some more current stuff. Um, the way that we met was definitely in, in reference to um, Black maternal health. Yes. So can you kind of share how that study came to be? Because I don't, need, I don't even know that aspect of it, kind of how it came to be, um, you know, what it was and, and, and whatever you could share about kind of the final, the result of it. Sure. Yeah. So that study actually came about because one of my students, um, a black woman, was interested in doing some research before she graduated. Mm -hmm. And she was very interested in um, what she was calling at the time alternative births. And she said as she was reading about home births and birthing center births, she ra very rarely saw black women's uh, narratives, their voices centered in the literature that she was looking at. And so um, you know, I was like, well, I'm gonna help you get a little research in. And she was gonna be graduating like in a semester. So I knew that, you know, it was, it was gonna be a tough, uh, a tough uh, research project, but I wanted to support her in doing it. And so, um, you know, she came up with the project idea and we worked together to create um, uh, a uh, questionnaire. And then we, you know, then we're like, okay, now we gotta find these black women. <laughs> at home births and birthing center births. And to be honest, um, it was a very difficult recruitment process in the beginning, um, just identifying where people were located. And then we started kind of connecting to our networks and using um, relationships that we already had with black birth workers, with um, you know uh, midwives and doulas and lactation consultants. And as soon as we started
started to find a few people, then they were like, oh yeah, and I know these people and I know these people and they kind of connected us. And so, you know, she was able to do about five interviews before she graduated. And then she graduated, went to graduate school. And I said, well, we have to finish the project. And she's like, okay, you handle it, Dr. Baker. I was like, okay. (laughs) So that following summer, we did 25 more. And so we had 30, we talked to 30 black women who had had a home birth or a birthing center birth. And again, the the whole goal of that project was to say, you know, that black women are making this choice and that they are having these experiences. And I don't know why people aren't including them, you know, in the studies, but we're going to include them intentionally um, in in this study. And um, so that's where that project came from. That is amazing. And if anyone was interested in kind of seeing the results of it, is that something that's publicly available? So we have disseminated, and I'll just also name the students, Kamaya Miller. I want to just give her a shout out. Um, Yes, thank you. (laughs) It was her idea in the first place. Um, So we presented the findings at the American Public Health Association conference. So you could find the abstract there. We also presented some of the findings at the Black Communities Conference Mm -hmm. in, um, in North Carolina. You can find, if you Google, you know, you could find the abstract there. But one of the things we're working on right now is a creative form of dissemination. So um, one of my colleagues at Elon, um, Dr. Um, Professor Keisha Wall, she is a, a choreographer. And um, I watched one of her choreographed pieces to a beautiful poem. And I thought about the words that I heard when I was doing the interviews um, with all of the women that one summer. And, and the, the, the words of, they were, the experiences were so beautiful. It made me kind of want to be pregnant again. <laughs> so I could maybe like have that experience. Now that mm-hmm. desire didn't last super long, but it just, <laughs> I was like, wow, like the, 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 the stories and, in the, in the experiences just felt so, um empowering and um and it just wasn't my experience and i thought it was so important for people to see that some black women are having a good experience right and i know right now a lot of the narrative around black birth outcomes is is from a a, ba- a negative perspective which is important right because we we do have inequities with respect to maternal morbidity and mortality and infant mortality so we absolutely need to be having those conversations mm-hmm. But the stories that I was hearing that summer were so different, you know, from those narratives. And I thought it was important to figure out a way to get this information out. Because the other thing I was noticing is some Black women were starting to feel, and uh, Black women and Black birthing people were starting to feel a little concerned about having children. You know, there was, you know, the fear of what, you know, having to go to a hospital or the fear of what might happen was actually impacting family planning decisions. And, um, you know, there isn't just one narrative. And I think it's important to kind of tell the multiple um, experiences that are that are happening. So uh, she and I are uh, partnering to create um, what we're calling a documentary dance where we will, she choreographed dancers um, to the words of, of uh, the folks who were interviewed. Um, and we'll see what happens. (laughs) So I think it's gonna be beautiful. I was there for several of the different uh, filming uh, pieces. I think it's gonna be great. And I think that type of dissemination actually will reach far more people than, you know, an article. The research, yes. And and I think, um, you know, it's just a powerful use of your platform and the information that you do have to share and putting it in a way that is is somewhat more digestible when you put it in in more of an art form as opposed to the research but i think you know you hit it spot on and that's the kind of the mo- that was the motivation in even doing this you know this podcast was really about hearing more of those stories because like you said I was in those spaces where we're talking about maternal mortality and from yes and and we're in spaces with, we were talking to like nursing students and, and mm-hmm. men and their young people haven't had children before. And to see the expression on their face as these statistics are being quoted and, yeah. you know, young black women. And it's just like this, like a deer in headlights is it and, and the fear that comes from it. But we have to hear all sides of it. 
all of it and bring balance to it. And then there's this consistent theme that I think that I've found to be true in speaking to women who, who have had favorable outcomes mm -hmm. um, of the, the sense of empowerment, but also taking the steps beforehand to be in a position where they had um, the support around them, advocates right. around them. They they had a, a clear understanding of what they desired and what their options were. Right. Um, so that the information and the education seemed to play a significant role in having those outcomes as well. So just what you're doing, um, how you're bringing it all together, the fact that you got 30 women <laughs> to share their story and to compile that because you're absolutely right. You go on these... I know when I was pregnant, like the last time I was pregnant was about eight years ago. Okay. But, you know, I was searching and, and looking at when I was even thinking of this concept, looking up birth stories, just mm -hmm. wanting to hear birth stories, yep. and finding different platforms and, and podcasts and YouTube channels, mm -hmm. but very few and far between look like me. That's right. So it was like, mm -hmm. okay, there's a great need because you, to be bombarded with the statistics, it's like, Oh my gosh, I'm pregnant. Like, right. I'm going to die. Like that. That literally is like some of the conversations. And then the start, the the reality. It, like, I got a call today about someone who lost a daughter during childbirth, and it was like her um, third child. So it's not like these things aren't happening. That's right. So we do have to tell the story. The research has to be put out there We to, to even have an idea that some yes. things are working and what those things are. Um, it's just, it's empowering. It's so necessary. It is. Yes. It is. And, and it's not fully accessible to all people, right? I mean, the, the story, while I said the stories were, were beautiful, they weren't you know, not, they weren't uncomplicated. They were, you know, there were, you know, stories of, of people who kind of said, well, I had to wait. I plan my pregnancy around when I get my tax refund so I could be able to pay the cost that it would take to go to a birthing center or they had to drive hours, you know, to find a birthing center mm -hmm. or they were birthing in states that where home births were illegal. Yeah. So the financial and access to having a delivery like this is not accessible to everybody. Um, and I think uh, because there's so such low rates of, of birthing folks who, who do have home births or birthing center births, it's just not a part of our dominant conversation. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to be honest about that too, yeah. um, because it, it wasn't always an easy process uh, of navigating that, that choice. So true. And then, you know, with the the popularity of doulas um, and that now becoming somewhat of a, a, a common term, mm -hmm. um, I'm grateful for the legislation and at least the conversation around making just that aspect alone more accessible. Yes. And I know we can get into the greater conversation of, you know, what your options are, especially if statistically we're finding that we're having better outcomes when we're able to choose who's in our birthing space and where we right. choose to birth. Yes, um, but again, that, that policy side of it is so significant and you need the research to impact the policy side and just mm -hmm. understanding how all of these things are interconnected and, and we need voices. We need, you know, we need the academic, we need, you know, women, we need those who support birthing people to yeah. really, you know, have an understanding of what is going on and how we can impact change in that regard. So I'm so grateful for this platform. I'm grateful for what it is that you're doing. Like the project seems dynamic with the yeah. art aspect of it and really bringing voice mm -hmm. and, and, and a platform to share these stories of the yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grateful. You know, it's, it's been a, it's been a very collaborative work. And even, at, even after Kamaya graduated, there were other students who kind of came on and helped to support the project. Um, right now, Queen Estada Stevens is a student who's working with me and she's super creative, which is not, you know, my skill. So she's been a really great um, addition to the project. And I think also out of that project have come a lot of other initiatives. You know, when you start to spend a lot of time hearing the experiences of people who are, who are birthing and you hear what's possible, mm 
mm-hmm. you know, what, what's, then you can start, you know, advocating in a really different way. I think a lot of times when we focus too on, on negative experiences that we aren't even allowing ourselves to imagine what it might be to have a liberating experience, even in a hospital setting, or to create more access for that type of experience for people who are in communities that might not have birthing centers or sufficient numbers of midwives, you know, to provide support. So that, I think that's the other wonderful consequence of that, of, of, of spending that summer just in conversation with so many of you all was, it, it helped me to, to, to widen and broaden um, my imagination around what is possible and what we can actually require and respect and expect of, of, of birth providers and birth workers in, in hospital settings or who may not have, you know, an analysis or a lens to understand the ways in which they're actually perpetuating, um, you know, kind of uh, implicit biases and, and racism in the work that they're doing. So you said a key term that I I think, you know, might need to just be unpacked a little bit for those mm-hmm. who aren't familiar, um, the implicit bias. Mm-hmm. And is that something I heard, I heard the term first, you know, doing the work and being in the spaces, talking in the OBs and the midwives and um, how that's impacting birth outcomes. Is implicit bias a term that's used across your research? Because I know you deal with racial indifference and injustice? Yeah, implicit bias is a complicated, you know, concept. It is something that I think people have really rallied around because when we when you hear something like, well, everybody has biases, right? And and we all are operating on our implicit biases and we've all, you know, been exposed to these narr- these false narratives, these false truths um, that impact how we treat people it just is a little bit more palpable, you know, for people to kind of rally around. And even and there's still some people who kind of don't believe that they exist, but it's it's something that can sometimes help us enter into a conversation. But the reality is also is that we could, you know, do a bunch of interventions to address implicit bias and we probably would still have these racially inequitable outcomes because if our systems and institutions aren't holding people accountable for making decisions based off of implicit bias. And there's no kind of checkpoints to identify when somebody's making a bad decision in the moment, you know, and in in, in so that in that moment, you could shift what you're doing and do something differently to hopefully have a different outcome. Like we don't have those systems of accountability in place. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do think it's important to acknowledge and recognize that implicit bias is an important contributor but it's not, you know, the full contributor to the racial inequities that we see. And it's an ins- it's, it's an insufficient response to a structural system, you know, that's been built on racism. And that's why we have racial inequities. Um, it's the systemic piece of it that is critically important to understand how our society was structured, how our hospitals systems are structured. Um, that's why we have racial inequity. Absolutely. And that speaks to just the importance of understanding the history and and where this comes from, because I hear, you know, in conversation, people don't understand the systemic aspect of racism. It's not that you just don't like somebody or, you know, you don't want to, you know, provide service to them. Mm -hmm. It's so far beyond that. Mm -hmm. Like every aspect of your existence is impacted by the system that it is built Mm -hmm. upon and understanding the history behind that and how we get to this point so that we can discuss, you know, the changes necessary to get to where we would desire to be. Mm -hmm. What is the current research that you're doing? How does kind of all of this, I know there's there's definitely a continuous vein mm-hmm. in all of it. What are you currently working on? So some of the work we're currently working on, we I, I just worked with a, a team of folks in Alamance County, which is where um, Elon University is, to talk to um, birthing people about their interest in a universal home visiting program. So Alamance County has a really large racial inequity and in infant mortality. And, um, you know, home visiting programs have been demonstrated to be effective in identifying challenges or problems that may not have been caught in the hospital. 
And so um, the challenge though was, is that there was already a home visiting program in the county and it was serving predominantly patients with Medicaid and it, what, it hadn't been successful. So people weren't necessarily opening the door when providers were coming. Uh, and, and it is a lot to in, invite somebody into your mm -hmm. home space. And there's just so many issues, you know, layered on what that means and being surveyed and, and judged and, and all of that. And so, how that implicit bias plays a, a role in that, especially if the person coming to your home may not look like you or understand the culture in which you come from. That's right. Wow. Right. So um, talk, we talked to many uh, Black, Latino, um, in, uh, or Latina, and, and folks living in rural communities to, to mm -hmm. about whether or not they might be interested in a home visiting program. And if they, if they were, what they would want it to look like, who they would want to actually come into their homes. And the unfortunate reality is whenever we do these types of kind of small projects, we learn even more about the experience, the negative experiences that people are having interacting um, with healthcare systems, whether it be prenatal care or labor and delivery or, um, you know, postpartum care. So we can't ignore that. Um, and then uh, we, you know, try to invite then participants who are interested in continuing to be a part of the conversation into some of the spaces, the organizations and agencies that might be doing some or, uh, work to try to address, you know, what's happening, what's going on. Um, I have another student who's actually looking at um, the reproductive justice experience of Latinas in Alamance County. And, and for her project, we're really focusing on the diversity of the Latina community because a lot of times we lump, you know, communities of color as to being this monolithic kind of um, thing. And we know that that's not true. We know that there's socioeconomic diversity and there's, um, you know, some folks are born in the United States, some for folks are born outside of the United States. Um, there's lots of ways to get a little bit deeper into understanding what's actually going on and what's happening and, and how we can think about, you know, sharing that information back with providers and, and thinking about how we can encourage our providers to create more culturally responsive care um, strategies and approaches and, um, you know, deal with some of the implicit biases that are actually, you know, really impacting um, the experiences that people are having. Yes. So if people want to get in touch with you, if they want to read, you know, maybe some of your articles or publications, how do they find Dr. Baker? Sure. Well, Elon has the, you know, a, a profile. I didn't even, I'm going to share this too before we finish. So my, my colleague and I, uh, Dr. Young Fauston, just recently launched um, a lab and we call it the HER Lab, Health Equity and Racism Lab. Um, and that is uh, uh, something that came together through our shared interest in really holding one another accountable to addressing structural racism in, in the research that we're doing and also to being committed to training our students to have that depth of an analysis as well. So our lab is focused on research, but it also really lifts up the importance of capacity building. So strengthening mm -hmm. our own and our students' capacity to think deeper about our problems so that we are not blaming individuals, but really getting at the roots of how institutions and systems are contributing to the inequities. And the other arm of our lab is advocacy and action, because we think it's really important and critical to understand that research can be a tool, you know, to advocate for, um, for policies and shifts and changes and in, in, in how our, our society works. And so um, you can, you know, folks can go to her lab, uh, dot org to find our website and we're also on social media at her lab underscore Elon. Excellent. Excellent. Now that's powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. So as far as um so there's the her lab mm -hmm. and we can Google I'm gonna put that in the comments in reference to the specific study that was um, regarding the stories of the birthy black birthing women. Yes. And that was, um, if you could just repeat that one more oh, time. Oh, sure. Yes. We presented at the American Public Health Association conference. It was the 2019 conference that was in Philadelphia. 
Um, and then also at the Black Communities Conference, I think it was at 2019 as well, and it was in Durham, North Carolina. That is excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, I truly appreciate it. This is a long time coming. I am so grateful that you were able to, you know, get on and we could have this conversation. I definitely will look forward to, you know, just expanding upon it and keeping up with some of the things that you're doing because again, it's all interconnected and it really is all solutions oriented. And I appreciate that and, and just really bringing the community in in a different perspective into the research aspect of it. So Dr. Baker, thank you so much. Thank you. For some of your time this evening. Yeah. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Be well and be safe. Please do the same. Peace and blessings, everyone. Thanks for joining us.